You're sitting in an airport lounge, anxiously awaiting your flight's departure. People are milling around and trying to get in line in order to get on the plane first, but you'd rather wait back and enjoy the last moments of space before being crammed into your seat. Eventually, it's time to board, and you settle into your seat with your tiny plastic glass of Sprite and an even tinier bag of peanuts. You flip through a magazine, only half paying attention to the safety presentation happening in front of you. You've flown many, many times, and it's become pretty routine. But today, there will be nothing routine about this flight. I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dress, consume, and connected. And today, we look back on an astonishing aviation story and the remarkable work of the pilots on board. This is the story of Air Canada Flight 143. What unit of measurement do you use? Depending on where you live, you may be more familiar with the imperial or metric system. If you live in the U.S., you're probably used to imperial that measures things in inches, feet, miles, pounds, and gallons. And most everywhere else uses metric, which measures things in centimeters, meters, kilometers, kilograms, and liters. But then many find themselves using a bit of both. Here in Canada, we used to use the imperial system or Canadian units of measurement as it had been known. But in the 1970s, a change began to move everything over to the metric system. Why am I talking about this? Because it's the key part of this entire story, and we'll get back to it in a moment. And our story starts in July of 1983 with a five-month-old Air Canada Boeing 767. Since this plane was essentially brand new, there shouldn't be any possible issues as it went through maintenance checks. But with this one aircraft, there was one problem. While on the ground in Montreal, the FQIS didn't appear to be functioning properly. The FQIS is known as the Fuel Quantity Information System Processor. This computer controls the fuel pumps and the gauges that display how fuel is being used. With the computer not working, the crew had to do things by hand and measure what was used by manual calculations. This is a crude comparison, but think of these manual measurements like using the oil dipstick on a car to measure the oil levels. The manual measurements weren't physically checking all the fuel, but using calculations to determine how much they had. But when you combine a brand new plane with state-of-the-art technology that not everyone fully understood yet, and combine that with changes that could affect calculations, you could have a big problem on your hands. So it's July 23rd and coming on board this plane in Montreal is a whole new flying crew, including Captain Bob Pearson and First Officer Maurice Contel. The two were extremely experienced pilots. Pearson, then 48, had 15,000 hours of flying time. He'd even flown gliders along with commercial planes. Quintel, only 36, still had 7,000 hours of flying time under his belt. Quintel had even trained in the town of Gimli, Manitoba with the army. Basically, these two had a lot of experience. In 1983, Canada was now in the midst of changing over from imperial units to the metric system. It was a slow process converting things over, but for the time being, the only planes at Air Canada fully using the new metric system were the brand new ones, those being the 767s, which they only had a handful of. The new planes also had gauges that displayed fuel amounts in kilograms, these new planes were the height of technology, and they took some getting used to. Air Canada Flight 143 was scheduled to leave Montreal for Edmonton, Alberta by the way of Ottawa. Scheduled on board that day were around 60 passengers. Before everyone settled into their seats, maintenance crews had prepared the plane for departure, including the fuel fill-up. 
The flight called for just over 20,000 liters of fuel to make the return flight from Edmonton. But the crew, having been used to the imperial system, filled it with 20,000 pounds of fuel. That's only about 9,000 liters. Because of the malfunctioning processor and based on the incorrect manual calculations, the cockpit crew went about things with the understanding they had the correct amount of fuel in kilograms, which they manually entered into the flight management computer. Even though the plane's fuel gauges now showed kilograms, they weren't of any use because of the fuel system information processor error. So, because of the electronic issues and the confusion over the new metric system, Flight 143 barely had enough fuel to make it halfway to Edmonton. Flight 143 took off with everything seemingly normal. It was a short flight to the first stop in Ottawa, where Captain Pearson had the ground crew re-dip the plane to make sure they had measured the fuel amount correctly. They didn't have the computer measurements to display the fuel information. They were going off calculations. Calculations that were based on kilograms of fuel and not the pounds that were actually in the plane. After leaving Ottawa, Flight 143 reached its cruising altitude of about 40,000 feet. As the passengers were finishing up dinner, the first warning signal came on. The engine indicator alerted the pilots that there was a fuel pressure problem. It appeared the fuel pump on the left wing had failed, but this was a brand new plane. How could that have happened? One of the only explanations was a lack of fuel, but Pearson had made the ground crew run the numbers multiple times. The alarm had gone off twice. Was it an instrumentation problem? Either way, the situation was becoming alarming. If fuel was indeed low for some reason, they needed to alter their plans. Edmonton was still some 700 miles away. The route from Montreal took Flight 143 over a lot of sparse land that might not have many options to land a plane. This wasn't a small Cessna after all. One option for a possible emergency landing was Winnipeg, Manitoba, home of the Jets, Chris Jericho, Neil Young, and host of Let's Make a Deal, Monty Hall. Assuming they have the fuel, the descent begins into Winnipeg. But more warnings are triggered from the fuel pumps. The crew believes it has to be an instrumentation issue until the left engine completely goes out. This is the indicator that they are indeed running out of fuel. A 767 can land with just one engine, but they needed to get this plane on the ground as soon as possible. Passengers unaware of any issues are now informed of a possible emergency landing. But then another fuel light came on. Just a few minutes later, another alarm. This one was a sound both Pearson and Kintel had never heard before. It was the EIC-8S, the Engine Indicating and Crew Alerting System. It indicated the nightmare scenario. Both engines were out. In the documentary by Air Crash Investigation about Flight 143, Bob Pearson explains how all the displays, screens, and digital information in the cockpit simply went black. They couldn't even be detected by air traffic controllers. The Boeing 767, a technological marvel filled with 61 passengers plus the crew, was now nothing more than a 120-ton glider. At this point, they're still about 26,000 feet in the air and aren't near any major airports. The pilots had trained to land a plane running on one engine, but with the loss of both, this was probably going to end catastrophically. Because here's the other problem. The engines not only create the thrust for the aircraft, but they also provide power for the APU or auxiliary power unit. The APU can provide some power and electrical for emergency situations, but it used the fuel from the main tanks, 
With no fuel at all, the APU was rendered useless too. But there was one last hope, the RAT, the Ram Air Turbine. This was the very last line of defense that Boeing had installed on their planes. If there is a total loss of power, the Ram Air Turbine is automatically deployed. An arm comes down from the underside of the plane and attached to it is a propeller. This isn't a big propeller, mind you, but about the size you would see on a small Cessna. The air from the slipstream coming underneath the aircraft spins the propeller, which drives a hydraulic pump that gives you very basic systems to hopefully control the plane. Think of the rat as an analog solution to a digital problem. It's like taking out an oar when a motorboat's outboard engine dies. It's not a lot, but at least it's something, especially when you're nearly 30,000 feet in the air with no engines and no fuel. Everything 80s will return after these messages. I mentioned earlier that Bob Pearson had extensive experience flying gliders, but gliders were a whole different ballgame. This was a giant 767. Was there any way to apply his experience to this situation? And if he could, where could they even go? Where could they even attempt to land Flight 143? Thanks to the RAT, Pearson had just enough hydraulic pressure to move some of the control surfaces. You'd think with no power and no fuel, and because of the enormous size, that the 767 would just drop out of the sky. But the aerodynamic design of the 767 allows it to slowly descend, and thanks to the control of Bob Pearson, that's what it did. Slowly, but surely. He was in control of the 767, actually gliding the dead Air Canada Flight 143. But if they were going to land this thing, it would be with no power, a true dead stick landing as it's called. Unfortunately, if they could even find somewhere, they were still looking at a crash landing. As Pearson is gliding the plane, Maurice can tell is figuring out how fast they are going, combined with how much they have descended. With no technology on board, Kintel has to do his calculations by hand. So could they still make it to Winnipeg? Kintel figures out that at the speed they are moving and the amount they are sinking, they would never make it. But then he remembered something and quickly informs Pearson to turn north. Gimli, Manitoba is on the west side of Lake Winnipeg and is home to maybe a few thousand people. It's small and maybe about 55 miles north of Winnipeg. Sorry, about 90 kilometers north of Winnipeg. Gimli has nice beaches and is a good place to head for some fishing and relaxation. It's also closer to Winnipeg and contains something very interesting. An abandoned Royal Canadian Air Force base. This is the very place that Kintel had been stationed years ago and knew very well. The base had two runway strips, both nearly 7,000 feet long or about 2,100 meters. Long enough that they would hopefully have enough length to land Flight 143. But since this is a decommissioned air base, there isn't any emergency equipment on hand. There wasn't even a control tower. At this point, flight attendants are instructing passengers on how to brace for a crash landing. Some people are even writing goodbye notes to their loved ones. As they approach Gimli, there was another problem the pilots weren't aware of. Kintel hadn't been to Gimli for years and didn't know that one of the runways had been turned into a two-lane drag strip to race cars. Meanwhile, Pearson is making his approach into Gimli. Despite not having any power, they are able to lower the landing gear as the weight of the back gears uses gravity, allowing them to naturally lower and lock in place. But the front nose gear isn't as heavy and doesn't fully deploy. And there's yet another problem. Since Pearson can't control the speed, 
and by continuing the rate of descent, there was a chance they could overshoot the runway. And if he brought it down too steeply, well, they wouldn't be able to stop and that could be catastrophic. This always reminded me of Apollo 13 as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Come in too shallow and you could bounce off the atmosphere like a rock skipping off a pond. Come in too steep and you're dead. At around 3,000 feet, Pearson again went back to his knowledge of gliders. He would try to slip the plane. This is what's known as a forward or side slip and think of it as drifting a car around a corner. Using this technique, Pearson would bring the plane in almost sideways to slow it down in the air, then straighten it out as they hit the runway. This technique allows the plane to drop quickly, but not make it go any faster. This move that was normally limited to small gliders was now being attempted on a commercial Boeing 767. The more I've learned about all this, the more mind-boggling this really is. As passengers hang on for dear life, half of them on one side of the plane can only see the sky, while the other side is staring directly at the ground. But they're not out of the woods yet. I mentioned how the airstrip had been converted for drag racing. Well, as Pearson fights the plane manually, they get closer and closer to the runway. Both pilots can see for the first time that they're approaching what is now the Gimli drag strip. It already seems that everything that could go wrong has gone wrong, but it's just got worse. It's Saturday, and that means it's family day at the car racing drag strip. All over the converted runways are cars, go-karts, people, tents, and kids everywhere, including a few kids on bicycles who are now seeing this giant plane heading toward them in deathly silence. Despite the side slip, Flight 143 was still coming in hot at speeds of around 180 knots, which is in the range of 200 miles per hour or 330 kilometers per hour. People everywhere scramble as Pearson straightens out the plane, landing it before the nose of the plane slams down onto the ground. With no front landing gear, Flight 143 is skidding fast down the runway. As Pearson tells it, he looked up and saw some kids on bikes about a thousand feet in front of them. One of those kids was Art Zook, and in an interview with City News, Zook says how they didn't hear a thing until the sound of the deep thud as the plane hit the ground, and then the feeling of the ground moving. As the story goes, the kids start to pedal, attempting to outrun the plane on their bikes as the plane is quickly gaining behind them. The plane eventually skids along a guardrail down the middle of the runway, coming to a stop barely a hundred or so feet from a camping site and group of people. The lack of front landing gear ended up being a good thing as the nose dragging along the tarmac allowed it to stop much shorter than if the wheels were properly deployed. When all the dust settled, everyone on board the plane had survived. Pearson and Kintel had pulled off a literal miracle. Also amazing is how relatively minimal the damage was to the aircraft. Also amazingly, after repairs, the plane re-entered the Air Canada fleet and continued to be used all the way up to the year 2008. But that actual aircraft would forever be known as the Gimli Glider. What Pearson did that day is nothing short of miraculous. To have the focus and instinct to not panic, but do everything in his power and experience to save the lives of everyone on board is truly remarkable. But a ton of credit also needs to go to Maurice Cantel as he convinced Pearson to abandon the attempt at landing in Winnipeg and head to Gimli. Had they gone to Winnipeg, it looks like they wouldn't have made it. So, seems like a happy ending and no doubt some kind of hero's parade or recognition of heroic bravery. That didn't exactly happen. <laughs> 
An inquiry was immediately launched, and Air Canada claimed that, despite saving the day, Pearson and Kintel and the ground crews were to blame for the inadequate amount of fuel on Flight 143. The inquiry dragged on for about a year, but in the end, Air Canada was found at fault for what could have been a true disaster. Pearson, Kintel, and the crew were finally commended for how they handled the nightmare situation. The Gimli Glider event also shone a light on the fact there weren't proper manuals and procedures in place that led to the fueling issue. The new technically advanced aircrafts were introduced without the proper training. At this point in the 1980s, the computer era was advancing so quickly and not all the necessary steps had been taken to manage it. Air Canada was ordered to improve procedures and lines of communication. The Gimli Glider event also changed aviation around the world. In a report on the CBC, Pearson explains that within three weeks of the Gimli landing, he met pilots from Scandinavian Airlines saying they were now training on doing dead stick landings. There are a lot of remarkable what ifs that led to the story of Air Canada Flight 143 and the fact it ended up miraculous instead of a tragedy. What if there wasn't a manufacturing error with the fuel quantity processor on the 767? What if there wasn't the confusion over pounds and liters? What if Pearson didn't have an extensive glider background? What if Kintel wasn't familiar with Gimli? What if the plane was on an entirely different route? There were so many remarkable factors that allowed this event to occur. It was an everything that could go wrong, did go wrong situation, but also led to it being one of the most remarkable stories in aviation history. It's also interesting to look at the Boeing 767, which back in 1983 was the height of technology. But it was manual, simple gliding that would save everyone on board. Despite the rapid advancements in computer technology happening in 1983, it still took an analog approach to avert a tragedy. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you heard, there's plenty more where that came from. So be sure to check out my earlier episodes. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the Everything 80s podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. If you're in a position to help support the show, you can consider becoming a part of Patreon.com. That's the platform to get bonus audio content, including things like the Everything 80s Movie Review Podcast. So if you want to learn more and check that out, you can head on over to patreon.com slash 80s. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash 80S or click on the link in the description. So thank you for spending your time here with me today. I know there are a million podcasts out there. So the fact you're here with me right now means the world. So I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.